have Mr. Tisney present his ideas for eight minutes, and then he will be joined by Janet Haven, who will then pre present her perspective on this issue. Um, they will then respond to each other's comments and then we'll open the floor to questions. So if you don't mind, you can start putting in your questions in the Q&A as soon as you would like. So we're about to begin, but first let me describe Mr. Tisney is the managing director of Luminate, which is located in the UK, but is a global philanthropic organization. He's also a leading innovator in public policy. And he's one of the founders of the Open Government Partnership, which he can explain if, if he wants. Um, then Janet Haven will speak and she is the executive director of the Research Institute, Data and Society located in New York City. And before joining Data and Society, she spent 10 years leading the Open Society Foundations work on technology's role in supporting and advancing civil society. So let's begin. Martin. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, so what I want to talk about briefly this morning, this afternoon, has to do with the, the collective nature of data. So what I mean by this is the collective nature of data means that people are more impacted by other people's data than they are by data about them. So take like climate change, the threat is societal as well as personal. And so the corresponding response should be both individual and collective. The problem that we have is that so many of our rights are individual rights, which means that a lot of responsibility is placed on individuals. So if you think of cookies and concept forms where individuals need to exercise agency and judgment, every time they visit a website, that's a little crazy. To give a different example, people have a right to safe drinking water, but the way that they exercise that right isn't by being encouraged to check the quality of the water with a special pipette every time they have a drink of the tap. The state takes on that collective responsibility, checking that the water's safe, auditing it, arranging auditing standards on behalf of all of us. Now, in the era of big data and AI, people can suffer because of how the sum of individual data is analyzed and sorted into groups by algorithms. There's novel forms of collective data-driven harms that are appearing as a result. Online housing, job and credit ads discriminating on the basis of race and gender, as many have shown. Now, but our public debate, our government, our laws, as I'll explain, are ill-equipped to deal with these collective harms. Now, data rights weren't historically as individualized as they are today. It's really starting in the 70s that the pendulum began to swing in the direction of individual privacy with the rise of computing. The Organization for Economic Development and Cooperation, the OECD, developed a set of privacy guidelines in around 1980. And those guidelines popularized the notion that individuals should give informed consent for any information used for and about them. Now, the irony of history is that as governments and laws moved from protecting groups to protecting individuals, technology firms were moving in the other direction from analyzing individual behavior towards that of groups. So if you think of it, the era of machine learning effectively either renders individual consent meaningless or dramatically reduces its importance. Even if I refuse to use Facebook, Twitter, or Amazon, the fact that everyone around me has joined means that there are just as many data points about me to target. Now that's characteristic of what I call collective data-driven harms. The more collective they are, the further they are related to the individual's experience. So think of it in terms of three levels that people suffer from data-driven harms. The first level is the one we're very aware of, the purely individual harms. So an individual is seen as unfit for employment due to data, maybe their age, directly related to them. The protections here that are well established in law, not the subject of our conversation today. Now, the second layer are inferred harms. That's a really important one. This is where the individual is inferred to be part of a group or a category of people, but the person whose data is used isn't harmed. So consider people publicly uploading photos of themselves on a, it's a real example, I won't give the name of the site, a popular American dating site, and these were used then by researchers controversially developing algorithms to ascertain people's sexuality based on their facial characteristics. 
Now, the individuals whose photos were used weren't the ones harmed. It's the people whose sexuality was quote unquote inferred, however spuriously, via these techniques who were the ones harmed. Now that's a real issue. Our laws today would put the onus on those who uploaded the photos to have a right over how they are used. So in a way you could argue that they're responsible for their use. That's a lot of responsibility on those people who just took the photo and uploaded it. What the law doesn't do is restrict or outlaw the actual algorithmic classification on the basis of its collective harmful impact. Now, the notion of purpose limitation, which means that you can't use data that I shared about, say, my energy bills for any other purpose than that which I originally consented to, in this case, related to energy. Now, that could help here. But even then, the starting point remains individual consent and is so far weakly enforced in part because you need to trace back, in this case, the individuals who uploaded the photos. And if you could find thousands of them, you could mount a class or representative action. But your case would rest on the fact that those photos weren't being used in the way those who took them intended them to be used, right? It wouldn't rest on their collective harmful impact. Now, I think we also need ways to start to deal with that collective harm. And then the third level here are optimized harms. Those are harms that are suffered as a result of how machine learning systems are optimized. As has been well researched, YouTube's algorithm has concluded that people are drawn to content that's more extreme, and that leads them down a path that, as um, the academic Zeynep Tufekci has written, might be harmless. You start with jogging, you end up with looking at ultramarathon videos, or very harmful. You start looking at political rallies, you end up looking at conspiracy theories. Now, the YouTube algorithm is optimized to one thing to have you spend more time on YouTube, whatever the cost to you and to society. It focuses on its users and not on anyone who isn't on the platform. Whoever sees the optimization of the YouTube algorithm, who monitors its impact on society? Do they have any power to make change if the impact is harmful? The fundamental issue here is the mismatch between the logic of the market and the logic of the law. So very briefly, what's the answer? I think the answer is to think about regulating for algorithmic accountability and not placing as much burden on individuals and individual agency, but that it, meaning the state, should take on a collective responsibility on behalf of the public. So hard accountability, strong regulatory oversight of data-driven decision-making, and the ability to audit and inspect the decisions and impacts of algorithms on society. It means three things, clear transparency, so to be transparent about where and when automated decisions take place and their impact on people and groups, specifically the types of transparency that lead to accountability. So the existence, the purpose, training data behind the algorithms in question, for example, that's the baseline for auditing. Then the right to give meaningful public input and call those in authority to justify their decisions. So mandatory public input prior to the rollout of certain types of key algorithms. So think of citizen juries made up of hospital patients, social care beneficiaries, and other healthcare recipients when rolling out a data-driven social care coordination system, for example. And then finally, teeth, the ability to enforce sanctions. It should be mandatory to establish auditing requirements for data targeting, profiling, verification, and content curation, to then equip auditors with that baseline knowledge and empower oversight bodies to enforce sanctions, not only to remedy harm after the fact, but to prevent it. So for example, only provide social media companies with liability protections if they comply with certain transparency and audit standards in the first place. So that's what I think we should be focusing on. And there are very few examples of such laws and approaches around the world. And um, perhaps we can talk about that in the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really fast. Um, let me before uh, Janet speaks. Let me remind you. Please put your questions in the Q and A because we want to answer as many of them as we can. Thank you, Janet. Great. Thank you. Well, Susan, thank you so much for having me today, and and Martin, thank you for that um, terrific setup um, and and for your paper, the data delusion. Um, so I, I want to start with what Martin and I agree on. Um, I, we agree very much on the idea of collective rights um, rather than individual rights, rights when we talk about data governance. Um, we agree on the idea of regulating algorithmic systems, not the people that are using them. And I think, and I would, I would say this, Martin, maybe I'm taking a liberty here, that we also fundamentally agree that leaving this set of governance concerns up to companies to solve through an ethics process is not going to result 
in meaningful checks on the harms of these systems, particularly to vulnerable populations, to black and brown individuals and groups where we've seen the greatest harms um, enacted. So what I want to do with my time is, is not really disagree with Martin, but to complicate our points of agreement. So why isn't this the model of data governance that we're using now? It makes a lot of sense. Um, what, what we're describing implicates a, a very different way of understanding the responsibilities of the state, of industry, and of the general public than we currently have. We are going to need new regulatory approaches and new interpretations of existing law in order to enact these ideas. And I think what's really hard is that it's, it's not obvious how we get from here to there. So first, I want to make a case for interdisciplinary approaches. Algorithmic accountability isn't a problem only of law or of administrative process. Um, these issues take us beyond, as Martin said, what existing privacy regulation, even more recent regulation like the GDPR, address. So what we're facing is a set of questions about context and values. Context of data sources, of the design process, of deployment environments, these matter when we assess real world harms. What are the values being encoded in an algorithmic system through its design and the data that are used to model it? So in a simple example, um, it makes a difference. For instance, if the Facebook algorithm that controls news feeds is trained to value content that is likely to drive more sharing over content that's likely to drive other kinds of engagement. We've seen Facebook become a powerful vector for disinformation partially because of that design decision. So my organization, Data and Society, studies these issues through the lens of social science. We work closely with lawyers, with policymakers, computer scientists, but we come at these questions largely from an ethnographic perspective to understand the societal implications of data-centric technologies. So with that interdisciplinary frame, I want to return to the spectrum that Martin talked about from transparency to accountability. And I'm going to talk through three complications that we're grappling with in this field in advancing transparency of algorithmic systems and three areas in advancing accountability. So first, what is transparency when we're looking at a complex technical system? Who does it serve? One kind of transparency is seeing where algorithms are used to make decisions. So in September of 2020, the cities of Amsterdam and Helsinki both launched the first public algorithm registries to make visible where algorithms were being used in the city government. And as is often the case in data governance, Europe is ahead of the United States in both law and experimentation. So I do wanna give credit to these city governments for testing something new. And yet these registries don't tell a complete picture. Uh, Fike Janssen and Corinne Kath, two European scholars studying AI governance, have noted how limited the listings of algorithmic systems are in the city registries. They note that the algorithmic systems determining outcomes in criminal justice or welfare distribution, to name two areas of great societal import, aren't included in the registries, and they are unlikely to be in the future. Why? So those algorithms are controlled by a different jurisdiction than the city government. What's included in the city government system are systems with decidedly less potential for societal and individual harm, automated parking, trash reporting. So one lesson there about transparency is that there are different kinds of systems that have different significance in societal context. When we demand transparency, we need to prioritize the visibility of algorithms that have the greatest impact on people's lives, law enforcement, public benefits, educational opportunity. Another kind of transparency is understanding how these systems work and what values are weighted in their design. So first we, we see an explainability problem. Most of us can't read an algorithmic system and understand what it's valuing and prioritizing. So we need new ways for more people to understand these systems. Some scholars like Timnit Gebru have suggested that data sets used in training algorithmic systems need to be accompanied by data sheets that describe the data sets, quote, motivation, composition, collection process, recommended uses, and so on. Other scholars have argued that the key motivation for explainable algorithms is that of recourse. What do you need to know in order to be able to object to the algorithm and that that should drive explainability? But that kind of meaningful explainability 
is actually impossible when algorithmic decision making systems are proprietary. So again, let's go back to Facebook's newsfeed algorithm. Despite all of the ink that has been spilled over Facebook's impact on elections, polarization, and civic life around the world, we're stuck with a hard reality. We can't really have an informed discussion because only Facebook employees know how the newsfeed algorithm works. Academic, civil society, investigative journalists are forced to reverse engineer those systems. Um, for instance, the Markup, which is an investigative journalist group recently, released a project called Citizen Browser, which aims to do just that. Citizen Browser allows participants in the study to install a kind of digital Nielsen box in their browser that tracks what the Facebook algorithm serves into their newsfeed and then aggregates that data for analysis. So this is really ingenious, but it's also, just to be clear, ridiculous that this is the kind of pretzeled reverse engineering that's our best shot at understanding how these highly consequential algorithms actually work. And then finally, in other cases, even when a proprietary algorithmic system is used in a government setting, such as a risk assessment tool in courtroom sentencing process, it may be protected by trade secrets law. And that means that a person who stands accused of a crime and is being sentenced by a judge relying on an algorithmic risk assessment scoring tool can't challenge its score. That's a violation of due process. Lawyers with low income client bases who often interact with government services such as child protection services, public housing and eviction and public benefits are increasingly finding that their clients are facing decisions made by algorithmic systems that can't be challenged in court because of the proprietary nature of the technology. Transparency will not reduce harms on its own. It is, as they say, necessary but not sufficient. So we need mechanisms, as Martin argued, for meaningful accountability for both companies and governments. So I'd like to turn and to talk about methods for algorithmic accountability. One key method uh, that's under discussion are algorithmic impact assessments, or AIAs. These are modeled on impact assessments from other fields, such as finance or environmental studies. So what's, what's complicating about algorithmic impact assessments is that there's simply not an out of the box solution. At this point, no one knows how to do an impact assessment on an algorithmic system that produces meaningful accountability, nor one that is genuinely informed by public input. The social context of, in which an AIA is undertaken matters deeply. So I want to I want to draw on some work um, by my colleagues at Data and Society and highlight three key sources of complexity. So first, what is an impact? What constitutes an impact is not obvious or clearly bounded. Who defines what an impact is from an algorithmic system? What counts? And the boundaries of what an algorithmic system can be considered responsible for will be shaped by social, economic, and political power. Second. Given the scale of adoption and the complexity of transparency, what does meaningful public involvement mean? Public input and participation is an accountability as an accountability process isn't synonymous with accountability to the public. The timing and nature of the public engagement, who represents the public and the response to that input by the institution controlling the algorithm all matter deeply. And I will just say the danger of accountability theater in this particular area is very significant. And finally, assessing impacts doesn't automatically translate to rectifying harms. We know this is, we know this is true already from the ways in which impact assessments in other sectors, the environment, finance, and so on are used to address harms or not. Likely, we will need multiple approaches to understanding impact and iterations of those assessments for different contexts and cultures. And coming back to one of Martin's main points, a governance process must include pathways to remedy and enforcement if it's going to bring about real accountability. Um, many accountability processes stop short of that crucial step. So a challenge for algorithmic accountability, despite the scale, the range of national and cultural contexts, is to build governance that sees the process all the way through to just outcomes. Thanks, I'll stop there. Thank you so much. So two very different perspectives. Martin, would you like to respond? Sure, yeah, a pleasure. Thanks, Janet, that was, that was great. So 
Um, no, I, I'm in strong agreement um, with what you've said. I think the thing about the algorithms being proprietary, I'm fairly sanguine about that. If they're of public interest, they shouldn't be proprietary. We should have a right of access to the algorithms in the same way that, you know, you point to the importance of design decisions, for example, optimization. Um, you gave the example of Facebook. I gave the example of YouTube. Like, we should have the right to know exactly how the optimization works in cases of algorithms that are of public interest. The reverse engineering um, that needs to take place right now, the cost, the time is, is frankly insane. And I think that mandating that type of openness alongside participation and accountability is precisely what I think a law on algorithmic accountability. In the paper, I call it a public interest bill and give some ideas that's exactly what it should do. Um, it's interesting, the, the European Commission came out um, last year and then again a few weeks ago with, with two strategies, one on data, one on AI. And the suggestion is to classify certain algorithms as high risk algorithms and impose greater standards on those. Now, what, where they're not clear is what the process is to define what those high risk algorithms are and how that would change over time. But I'm still optimistic. If you could have an open participatory process to determine what high risk means, and that can change over time, and that's reflective both of academic evidence and the lived experience of those who are most effective, I think that would be a really strong first step towards regulating these call them public interest algorithms. And I think it's important here to look at sort of different examples. We, we don't really have anything around the world um, that's quite what I'm talking about, but there is this um, relatively little known law in France that I think points a way forward. Um, it's called the Digital Republic Bill, um, La Loi sur la République Numérique. Um, and it's a 2016 law, and it's so far really the only, or certainly one of the only modern laws focused specifically on automated decision-making. Now there's a catch because the law applies to specifically administrative decisions taken by public sector algorithms, but it provides a sketch for what future laws might look like. Um, and it says the source code behind such systems must be made available to the public. Anyone can request the source code. Um, and so interestingly here, it enables people who are on the receiving end of those automated decisions really to challenge the role that automation played in the decision. So as mentioned, um, the source code to so the proprietary algorithms are listed amongst documents that have to be made available. And, and that law brings to the fore new questions about algorithmic accountability, but weaves them together with these older questions about accountability, participation, transparency that we're talking about. And importantly, the law enables organizations, not just individuals, to request information on the functioning of an algorithm, its existence, without needing to represent the specific individual or claimant. So I think it's a path towards um, the sort of the collective better, better understanding and regulating the collective harms that we're talking about. And I think you could very well put in that law, um, um, make it mandatory to have the types of data sheets that, that you refer to in Timnit Jebru's paper. So, that is one way um, towards collective data rights, and it's something right now that specifically the European Data Protection Law, the GDPR, doesn't do. So I'll stop there. I think there's a really you know, great conversation to have maybe in the Q&A also about participation, your last point um, about impact assessments. I think there's a lot we can learn from participation scholars, such as John Gaventa here, around the difference between empowered and consultative participation. Um, and I have no doubt that it'll be a, an arduous path. Janet? Great, thanks. Thanks, Martin. Um, so I guess just a couple of very quick responses, because I know we want to get to um, we want to get to Q&A. So interestingly, we have some experience already with the, the issue of accessing proprietary algorithms. And, and I will say, I think it's very difficult. I think that is going to be a really, really hard fight because proprietary algorithms are business secrets. They are they are the source of um, the source of revenue really for many, many of the companies that we're talking about, their core source of revenue, in fact. And, and so where we've seen this happen is where a, an algorithm, where a, a, a proprietary uh, protection on an algorithm like trade secrets law is, um, is directly uh, challenging a, an individual right, the right to due process. So we saw the state of Idaho in um, 2018, I think it was, uh, insists that risk assessment scoring algorithms um, have be be auditable. In other words, that they the trade secrets protections that were 
um, covering them and and uh, causing a a, um, a limit on due process for for people who are in front of the court um, was overridden. But it was very specific. And so I think one of the things that I think is um, is a little bit of a of a Mobius strip here is that we have to identify the harms in order to um, break the proprietary protections, but we have to break the proprietary protections in order to identify the harms. And I, I think figuring out sort of how we actually get around that um, is going to be one of the huge challenges. I'm, I, I'm very glad that the European Union is taking this up and I think we all need to, to um, watch that very closely. I will say, I. I am not as optimistic about um, the United States uh, following suit, um, given given our our history on these matters. Um, lots of other things to respond to, uh, but I think I'll leave it there so that we can get to well, questions. We have a few more minutes, so go ahead, please. Okay. Well, I guess the, the other thing that I would say is an, another place that I think we can draw lessons from um, in. Um, in thinking about the issue of naming high-risk algorithms, is um, is the the is where the open government data community um, has has traveled over the past ten years, and I think probably many people on this um, on this webinar, and certainly Martin and I both remember, and Susan, the you know the era of raw data now of the idea that we should just release everything, and and that was an early stage of of the open government data movement, and. And what we saw was as that movement matured, there was a, a much more um, nuanced approach to identifying what we then called high value data sets in government that had the most um, import. And I think that what we're going to see is exactly that process unfolding again when we think about algorithms and, and the kinds of transparency and accountability we're going to be needing to look for. And I think that that's really, really important, that sorting, because one of the things that I'm essentially pointing to in, in the talk that I gave and that I think is apparent to anyone looking at this is the scale of this issue is enormous. We are not talking about, you know, algorithms are used in limited places. They are used everywhere, um, and they will be increasingly so. And so, I think that we we need to develop rubrics that will allow us to sort and filter where greatest attention lies and the kind the different kinds of impact assessments that we're going to need to be doing on different kinds of algorithms, so that um, public input and um, and and regulatory energy is directed in the right place. Thank you for that. Martin, you look like you wanted to say something in response, you good? Okay, thank you guys so much. I have a ton of questions, but I will shut up and let's have our audience questions. So we begin with, can we, <laughs> can we regulate the data economy? So this person is saying, can we dial down the volume and circumstances that permit data sharing? Is that really what this is about? Anyone want to comment on that? I, how do you want to do it? Do you want to take one question at a time or just jump yes, in? Yes, I do, because these are yep. all very different questions. Janet, do you want to go ahead? Uh, so I'm sorry, I, I actually missed the question. Okay, so this person is asking, basically, is this really, like, you guys have posited um, that uh, it's, a, it's a legal mishmash problem between the actual use of data, right, versus, um, you know, and how we protect the rights as privacy versus uh, a design problem and values problem. This guy is saying, this person is saying, is it a market problem? I think so. so maybe I'll just jump in. I think, yeah, as I interpret, it sort of depends. As I interpret the question, it's also a question of like, you know, a lot of the arguments that I'm putting forward here that we're discussing have to do with data use more than they have to do. Janet, I'm not sure if you'd agree with that, but I think they have to do with data use more than they have to do with data collection. And that's been a big back and forth in the privacy community. You know, like, should we? focus on the collection problem? Should we have restrictions 
on collection, and that would be a way of dialing down the volume, right? Um, that permit data sharing. So I think here, like, I, that isn't so much the where we've been putting the focus up until now. I, until recently, tended to think that, you know, the cat was out of the bag um, in terms of data collection and that what we needed to do was to put as much, um, you know, sort of standards and requirements, auditability, et cetera, as I mentioned, on the data as it's, as it's used. But I, I think that the strongest argument when it comes to collection resides in, you know, the data, actually in data protection law and the requirement for purpose limitation. If you had purpose limitation seriously enforced, so as per my example, purpose limitation meaning you can only, you know, use the data for the purposes for which um, it was it was designed for, but that relies, I'm, I'm nervous about it myself because that relies on consent, right, on consent. So if you take a Nest thermostat, it would mean that you could only use the data for the purposes of like, you know, the good regulation of heating in your home. That would stop, it's a usage and a collection argument. You'd still be collecting it, but you would be putting very strong bars around further usage. So it effectively then wouldn't be further collected down the line. And that if that was enforced, it would be a major impediment to the entire data brokering industry, which underlies the sort of the ad tech business model. There are a couple of lawsuits in the European Union that are trying specifically to, to push at this, um, but, but I think it's, uh, it's worth doing, but I wouldn't put all my eggs in, in that basket. Janet? Um, well, I would say, I mean, in response to the question, is this is this a market problem? I would say absolutely is a market problem. You know, the uh, I think the, the the sort of Bible on this is Shoshana Zuboff's book, Surveillance Capitalism, that makes an argument about um, essentially the 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 form of capitalism that we are experiencing right now is driven by the idea of, of data collection, retention, and analysis. And so I think you're, wh whoever asked that question is exactly right to point that out, that that's not what, e neither Martin or I were talking about that. We're sort of coming at it from the other end of how do we, how do we regulate this environment that we're working in, as opposed to how do we go to the core business model that is driving these systems and change that. Now, that sort of ends up getting us into a, a much bigger conversation about global capitalism, which is probably not where we want to go right now. But I just want to acknowledge that I think that's exactly the right structural question to be asking. Great, thank you. Our next question says, um, is, it, is it a mistake in dealing with these issues as a trade-off between privacy and security? Is it better to say it's a challenge of security versus accountability? Janet, do you wanna stop given I started on the other one? Uh, yeah, I'm just, let me, give me a minute here. Um, Yes, I mean, I I don't think that the the trade off between privacy and security is um, is the right one. I think there are a number of trade offs that that we end up thinking about, and and frankly, those are um, those are in some ways um, really culturally, uh, you know, culturally framed. I think, for instance, in the United States. Um, you know, we really think about these issues, you know, particularly, for instance, in the in the issues around content moderation um, as as being about, um, you know, waiting, waiting privacy over and, and free expression. And, um, and in Europe, we we come at it from uh, a different perspective that that waits, um, that waits privacy protections and data protections. So, um, I think that that is contextual. I don't think that it is, it is only, uh, I don't think there's an absolute answer. I, I, I think I'd just say, I agree. I think I'd say there's something about the privacy issue that leads to sort of conversations about trade-offs and dichotomies. You know, is it privacy or openness? Is it privacy or security? I would tend to sort of back away from those. Um, and, and that's why I think it, it is helpful to look at the overall governance structures. I used to say, and I stand by that, that you know, it's not a trade-off between privacy and openness. Privacy and openness are two sides of the same coin. And what I was trying to say with that is that the question is one of data governance and the rules, you know, the very contextual rules that Janet mentioned um, 
that mean that in certain settings we would turn the dial up or down on you know free speech versus etc. So I think for me that's a helpful frame. Okay, here here's an interesting question. The providers of data driven services. I'm reframing the question. Um, um, uh, they respond to shareholders and they have to you know um, uh, show quarterly results over time. Um, and so this person says, I'm curious about the problem of temporality here and how temporality affects scope and scale. Um, how do we bring about a longer term scope and scale? Martin, you wanna start since Janet started before? So I, I think part of the answer to that scope and scale is for politicians and policymakers to be clear about, frankly, the type of society that we want to live in and what those outcomes look like within, ideally, I know it's slightly illusory given the electoral cycle, but at least an electoral cycle, if not sort of five or 10 years. I mean, so the point is, when we talk about, um, say, the optimization of the YouTube algorithm and it being sort of really focused around attention and clicks, I think to have that, and that's driven exactly as, as the question sort of hinted at, you know, like quarterly returns. Um, in order to have a powerful long-term answer to that question, we need to have a vision of the good life, so to speak. We need to have a vision. So what would an optimization geared towards the public good, the societal good, what would that look like? I think that's for me the answer to how we would sort of get away from that temporality vicious circle. Thank you, Janet? Yeah, I think, oh boy, I'm, I'm going to have to limit myself because I feel like I could say a lot about this. But I think that the, I think that the, um, the, my, my core response goes back to one of the first points I made in my talk, which is that um, we can't really cede this responsibility to companies to solve. And frankly, we did for like 50, you know, 20 years. Um, and, and allowed a, a, the growth of a tech, tech ethics industry um, in companies. And I think that there was a lot of, um, Silicon Valley did a great job of um, explaining to people that they weren't gonna be evil. And I think that that halo, which, you know, frankly, like if the oil companies said, we're not gonna be evil, or people would be like, what? Um, the tech companies, people sort of went along with it for a really long time and, and felt like that that was acceptable. And there's been a lot of effort to, um, to essentially place the responsibility for all of these, like, as Martin said, societal decisions about what values we want to emphasize on the tech companies. And as the person who asked this question correctly noted, actually, these are these are companies that are operating in uh, a, a system of financialized capitalism, right? Like they are not actually, um, they are interested in meeting the needs of their shareholders. And if alignment with a tech, tech ethics program is meeting the needs of their shareholders, they will prioritize it. Um, but that's why we have governments <laughs> because these are questions that um, exist in the public interest. They don't exist in um, the interest of, of companies who are looking to meet their shareholder needs. And so I think the, the fact that we're having this conversation about what are the government responsibilities? What, what does governance look like in this, um, in, in data governance? What does it look like to actually enact this through law and regulation is the conversation we need to be having. Thank you. Um, what's the potential impact of algorithmic impact assessments on national sovereignty and globalization? You know, we know that many governments are trying to use um, uh, deep learning to solve wicked problems, such as the spread of disease across borders or whatever. So what do you think? What's the impact? Is it good, bad, mixed? Well, so I would I would just say very briefly that I think that this question goes to um, another another point I was making that impact assessments of algorithmic systems are going to be have to be highly contextualized in the the intent of the system um, and the and the cultural context and legal jurisdiction and when it which is being deployed. 
So, so I don't think that there's a simple answer to that. I, I, um, I think that what a, um, what a kind of broad process of adoption of impact assessments will bring about in the future is an expectation that that's happening and an expectation that anyone should be able to look into an algorithmic system and have a better understanding of both what its designers intended and what its unintended consequences are. Um, and I think that that's true whether we're talking about um, algorithms that are being used in companies or algorithms that are being used in, in national context, whether it's national education or national security, um, et cetera. Martin, do you want to add anything? Might briefly, I, I agree. I might just add that um, I think what, yeah, I, the algorithmic impact assessments need to be highly contextualized. I suspect what will happen though, if, if we have our way, um, is that you will, they will become de facto standards. And as they become de facto standards, um, there'll be a need for global certification processes. I mean, at this point, like the AI field is highly unregulated. Um, and if you compare it to, to any, uh, and it's highly globalized. And so I think that the, the dilemma is going to be finding, you know, a just equitable line between highly contextual assessments that then lead up to global standards and then a feedback loop to ensure that those aren't, you know, just set in stone. And I think that's that's what's going to be um, tricky. I remain completely amazed that, you know, having had a background in the open government movement and a number of different sort of sub areas, such as the transparency of extractive industries and the huge amount of different global certification pro you know, processes therein, I remain amazed at the lack of, you know, certification schemes within the, within the AI field. So I think that is likely to happen. That's, uh, you know, fraught with difficulties, but I think that's likely to happen. Thank you. Has anyone tried to use the French digital accountability law to obtain Facebook's newsfeed algorithm? No, so they haven't. The reason, so so forgive me if I was, um, that example I think is helpful, but may also be unclear. So the catch with the Digital Republic Bill is it applies to administrative decisions of the French state. So it wouldn't apply in this case um, to the Facebook algorithm. But I think in terms of the laws that I've looked at and that I studied, I think that um, it's a really good example of what a law which is geared towards accountability would look like and, and how it could work. And I can give some examples later if we have time. But I think you, to, to do that, you need to expand it to look at the public and private sector. And that's, I mean, then it comes back to the earlier sort of you know, question and conversation um, about the trade secrets and the proprietary nature of the algorithms. What the Digital Republic Bill sort of circumvents as a problem is precisely that because it's dealing with public sector data, public sector decisions. And so that's why expanding it to the private sector, you would need to have definitions and regulations on what public interest algorithms um, are, you know, what they entail, and then you'd be able to, to look at Facebook. And if I may add a comment on that, uh, that in trade agreements is considered a performance requirement and is banned. So you can't uh, ask another, a, a firm coming from one country to provide its trade secrets in order to export or produce in that country. Okay, um, how will individuals be persuaded to support the collective regulations of companies whose proprietary benefits are so powerful? Anyone want to take that one? So, so one thing that I I would say is I think there's been um, I think there's been a great deal of focus on um, the role of companies and of regulating companies in this set of conversations that have been going on now for a number of years, and and I think that 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 conundrum of 
Um, but I, but I actually really like a lot of things about Facebook, despite the fact that I don't like the fact that I don't understand how the newsfeed works or, or other kinds of things like that. I actually really like my iPhone, et cetera, is, is really complicating in this, um, in this conversation. And it does, um, create, I think a lot of barriers to any kind of movement building, um, on, on this topic, where I think there is a real um, opening is actually in government use of algorithms. Um, I think that the, the um, sort of rising understanding of, of the algorithmic state um, is, is something that um, is starting to affect more and more people. And um, we see that in, you know, particularly right now, and I talked about this a little bit, the, um, the use of algorithms in determining outcomes for, for people, particularly who are part of um, government programs and government services like child protection services, access to public benefits, um, public housing and eviction process. Um, and what we're seeing is that right now that, that lawyers who are defending those clients um, who, may, who may run a, um, a low income law clinic, for instance, are incre increasingly running up against um, a, a, set of, um, a set of limitations in terms of how they can defend their clients because they can't challenge um, decisions that are being made against them using algorithmic systems. And so I think we're starting to see a movement. We've done some publishing on this at Data and Society, and we're starting to do some coordinating with lawyers groups to, um, to push this issue because it seems to me like a real a real wedge issue. I think we're also seeing that in um, in education, educational opportunities, and also um, you know different instances when we've seen um, you know scoring happen. There was a there was a, a quite a quite a scandal um, over the summer in in the UK over um, scoring of A levels um, using an algorithmic system and um, that brought people out into the streets. Um, it, was, it was a significant protest and people very clearly blamed the algorithmic system for making decisions about their futures. Um, and I think we're also going to see it as uh, COVID vaccines are rolled out. We already have seen it in a couple of places where algorithms made determinations about who should get a vaccine first. And um, when that came out, there were a lot of questions about like, well, how did that waiting occur and why should we trust the algorithm? So I, I think that what we're seeing is the public sector use is much more likely to drive real action um, as people see it affect such um, such core important parts of their lives. Martin? I might yeah I might add to that I I agree, but I think that there's going to be a need there's a need for some serious campaigning for people's concern about the impact of public sector algorithms to then bleed into um, how they think about big private sector companies that have very slick PR operations. So I agree, I, and I know you're not saying it'll just happen by itself, but I think like, and that the environmental analogy I think is helpful. You know, we need to have some like really serious and thoughtful campaigning about this um, because the notion of, well, you know, this is great for me. Like, you know, like I have a car and the car gets me from A to B and it's really convenient. Well, on the other side, the externality of your car is massive, you know, CO2 emissions, which lead to climate change. And I think just like breaking down that problem saying, well, you know, I have an iPhone, it's convenient. I can phone my friends and like use WhatsApp, et cetera. And they, that, that, that's why I think for me, like it's really hammering home the sort of, the fact that individually it may be convenient for you, doesn't mean that it's necessarily good for the collective. The externalities on society are huge. And in order to really make that point, we need some, some campaigning on a completely different scale that we have today. And if you look at the, the ecosystem, the environment in terms of campaigning, I think there's been a really radical shift over the past few years, campaigning groups such as in the US Stop Hate for Profit. Um, and they're especially powerful in the US. If you look at Europe, which is you know, one of the regions in the world where there's like real strength for regulation, there's very little in terms of campaigning. And even in the States, it's not as coordinated as it could or should be. What, what's needed is the equivalent of, a, if people are familiar, 350.org, a sort of a coordination body that can bring together these different campaigns and sort of like, 
bring the public together um, with the type of legislation or regulation that's needed. So, um, but yeah, it's a great question. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, <coughs> XS, why not regulate the data rather than the algorithm? <coughs> Do you want me to go? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Well, that, it's not a neither all. I think it's a both and. The issue is right. that up until now, we've regulated the data. Data protection laws regulate the data. The issue of data rights, you know, that you should have access to data about you, that you should have the right of erasure, the notion of purpose limitation that I mentioned, that data that if you consent to a certain usage for the data, that it shouldn't be used in other ways unless you consent again to that different type of usage. All of that is about regulating data. And I think that what I'm trying to say in part of our conversation is, yes, that's important. And I'm not and sometimes I think I make the mistake in trying to make the point to overemphasize it. It is a both and. Individual impact obviously matters a great deal as well as the collective impact. And in the same way, I think we should regulate data as well as regulating algorithms. I think from a US perspective specifically, I think my, my caution to, to all of you listening um, and to those involved in the new administration is I think it would be a mistake to put all of your eggs in the data protection basket. Um, you know, having a huge fight for years over a federal privacy law and coming out once the technology on the other hand is sort of, you know, running at like warp speed, you know, in another direction, having in four or five years time, a sort of equivalent of the general data protection regulation in the US after many fights and a lot of money spent, I don't think, I'm not saying it shouldn't be done, but I don't think it will lead to, to, to things that people, as much as people hope on the, Flip side of that, you know, acts such as um, I think it was in 2019, um, Janet, you'll know better, there was a draft algorithmic accountability bill that was being kicked around Congress. I think like those types of regulations, there was, um, I can find the, 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 the information here, there was a coronavirus bill actually that had some interesting information as to how algorithmic um, decisions were, were made in the US. I think those types of bills, yes, the emergency coronavirus stimulus package um, had a public health emergency private privacy act embedded within it. I think that those types of you know, areas focused on algorithmic accountability may have a better chance of happening in the US and of having impact. Right. I, I agree with all of that. I would just add that um, another reason to, to it, so first of all, I would really emphasize it's not an either or. Um, but secondly, regulating, the, the data is used to train an algorithm. And so the, the, the real value um, that, that uh, a company holds, for instance, is a, in, or in an algorithmic system is the model. Um, and so the, the model is trained on the data and then you can throw the data away. And so it is, um, I mean, th this, was, this was something that was very front and center in the, in the Cambridge Analytica scandal, for instance, that the, the issue that was really focused on in the media was the access to data, but what was really powerful was the model that was built. Um, and, and the model um, uh, is, is the is the part of it that that did not end up being um, end up being regulated? Uh, it was the data. Thank you. Um, so the next question relates to there's this distinction between while firms have property rights on a database, individuals don't have property rights towards their data. Do you think that should is this a fallacy of division? That is the root cause. Is this about property rights? Anyone want to take I started on? the last one. Uh, do you want to start on that? Um, I, I'm going to pass this one to you. I feel like you have a lot more to say on this. I feel pretty strongly that um, individual data ownership is itself a, a delusion. Um, at best, harmless. At worst, harmful. And I, and I am very concerned um, about the, the notion that, and that's actually why I started this whole piece of work, um, you know, after the Cambridge Analytica scandal. There was, I remember there was a, an op-ed in the Financial Times, the sort of British-less global newspaper saying, you know, 
yes, you know, Cambridge Analytica was a huge scandal, but if individuals owned their data, none of this would have happened, which is which is completely untrue for, for, for a number of different reasons and would, would have pernicious impacts. One of them is that the value of the data is in the network, it's in the linkages between the data, it's not in the individual um, data set itself. For, for, for that, um, I, I would refer the, the specific question, and I'm happy to be in touch offline if that's helpful. I wrote a piece in the MIT Tech Review on a bill of, um, of uh, data rights, and that specifically spoke to that question. I think that um, the approach we need is, is a protection of data rights, both individual and collective, rather than putting yet more burden on the individual through ownership of individual data. The other thing I should say is like, um, I, I'm not a, a data Luddite. I'm, I, don't, I don't hark back to days where, you know, things weren't digitized. I have a you know, long background in the open data movement. I'm very excited about the potential for good of data in society, as well as I'm concerned about its harms. And I think that another unintended impact of the sort of commodification um, of data is that it would restrict those positive impacts of data on society and it would create to yet more inequality because those who would stand to make more gains from the commodification of individuals data would be those who are richer, the majorities, those who are better represented and, and the communities that Janet mentioned, communities of color, indigenous communities, women, other minorities with those who would yet again stand to lose the most. Um, so I think that's a really important um, discussion to continue having. Thank yeah, you. and I, I would just um, to follow up on that. I would just flag um, the work of of a scholar who's who uh, was at Data and Society as a fellow, Jasmine McNeely, um, who gave. If if you're interested in the issue of data as property, she gave a fantastic talk on this. That's online. Um, if you if you Google Jasmine McNeely and Data Byte number one twenty seven, you'll find it. <laughs> Um, well, what about people who have no digital footprint, but may be discriminated against through an algorithm? Although I'm not sure how that could happen if they had no digital footprint. Well, I, I think this is the, the collective rights issue that, that Martin is, is pointing to. Um, people without a digital footprint can be discriminated against by an algorithm because um, if, if an algorithm makes a decision about a group of people based on a, um, a group identity and, and that person is um, in that group, then that will be applied to them. And I, I think when we, we talk about um, the, you know, the, the ways in which uh, particularly people in low income and vulnerable populations are, um, are targeted and are particularly harmed in algorithmic systems, um, this is one of the ways. Um, so I would say one, one sort of resource on this for people who are looking to understand this issue better is a piece um, called Poverty Logarithms. I, I referenced it in my, um, in my talk and there's actually a citations list that I think um, um, Susan is gonna send out after this talk, but that is listed in it um, and is, is specifically about that issue. If everyone can stay for a few more minutes, we have um, one more question. Um, I'm combining two, but um, so how do you educate the public about these issues? How do you get them to uh, to think of it as a collective as well as an individual harm? Janet, do you want to go ahead? Um. I, I, that's a, that's a tough question because as we talked about earlier, you are pushing back against, you're, pu you're pushing back against the sort of front and center. I, I really like my iPhone. I, I like being in touch with my friends on Facebook um, with something that's, that's somewhat abstract, um, you know, where the harms can be in the future or theoretical. And so I think that what we need to do, um, and this is, I, I would say, I think this is a gap in the field, um, is, is have much better um, public facing communications, much better communication from, from, the, um, from an evidence base, a, research, a set of research findings, of legal findings into the public 
um, sphere. And I think that, you know, that happens in, in I would say, you know, more, um, maybe more elite media through podcasts and, and things like that. But I think that um, seeing these issues raised in popular culture, um, in, uh, you know, in, in media, in ways that don't lionize technology. I think one of, one of the things that is very frustrating is um, that when we see the technology press cover new technology, it is often in a, a very, um, um, you know, a very credulous way that is, you know, here is an exciting new thing. And then at the very bottom of the article, there might be one line that says, you know, this raises privacy concerns <laughs> and that's it. And so I think there's also a question about, um, you know, working with journalists, with media to think about sort of how you really ask hard questions of new technologies and what the implications are for, for society at large, but also really importantly, as Martin said, for, um, for particularly vulnerable groups. Martin, yeah, I, yeah, just briefly, I, I think this, uh, look, it's a great question. How do you educate the public? I agree with Janet. I think that there's you know, sort of two layers to that question. Um, at, at a specific level, I think we need to work with journalists and other sort of influencers in the, in the wonk book, so to speak, to, to think differently about privacy. And to understand that, you know, one of the fallacies about talking about privacy is that we end up with this very individualistic way of framing what's increasingly a collective problem. So I think that's sort of step one. And, and, um, and I think we're in a better place now than we were previously for the following reason. I actually feel quite optimistic about this. Um, I also feel pessimistic, but I'll, I'll finish with that. I feel optimistic because, you know, sitting where I do very, you know, having the privilege of sitting where I do as a funder, I think the biggest change we've seen over the past five to six years has been the growth in the evidence of the impacts of algorithms on people and society, right? Um, if we think of reports by credible journalists such as Julia Angwin now at the markup, the work that she did at the time with ProPublica, looking at um, the racism of algorithms biased against black defendants of sentencing algorithms. Janet hinted at, at some of those. I think that's increasingly understood. I remember when the uh, AOC um, made a comment in Congress around sort of racist algorithms and that, you know, sort of run around the sort of Twitter sphere a little bit. I think there's an increasing understanding that yes, you know, it's not a crazy thing to say that algorithms are racist. And even at a very basic level, you know, Janet's point, um, you know, those demonstrations in the street in the UK in August, those were kids. Those were 18 to 19 year old kids who were finishing high school and who were saying, you know, beep the expletive, the algorithm. And I think that overall is very, is, is really powerful. And that's the direction I think we need to be going. And um, we're actually starting to do some work increasingly with, with creative industries, with filmmakers and others to think about it, to talk about it differently. One of the biggest problems of AI is effectively, you know, the sort of, well, in some ways like the biggest problem of AI used to be um, uh, the, the sort of the terminator fallacy that the problem that we needed to deal with was artificial general intelligence. And I think now the problem that we deal with, as Janet mentioned, is, you know, the sort of like benign tech entrepreneur. And this is what we need to be sort of changing and working with. The, the last thing on the pessimistic note um, is that, that evidence base is really heavily skewed towards the United States. And for primarily and secondarily, it's really heavily skewed towards the Anglo sphere, the Anglo speaking world. Um, and we need, because it's so contextualized, Janet, as you mentioned, we need to have that evidence on the impact of algorithms on, you know, Moroccan kids, Moroccan families living in Southwest France, on the impact on, um, you know, the Nubian population in Kenya, like a number of different, like, name your country, regions and countries right now, which were completely under-researched um, compared to the US. And that's not to say that I don't think research in the US is important, I think it's absolutely key. But if we're going to have an understanding and building that type of public education um, for firms that are so globalized, we need to do it in a globalized fashion as well. Thank you for the thoughtful comment. Thank you both for your insights. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you to our audience for joining us. Let me also thank our partners at GW, the Internet Society, CG and Luminate, who made this possible. 
Um, our next webinar will be on February 22nd, uh, where we'll be talking about how governments use and should use and should not use <laughs> digital identity services. So we'll give you some more later. If you want to rewatch this or you want to share it with your friends, it will be on our YouTube channel soon. Thank you again, Martin and Janet. We really appreciate it. Thank Have you, a Susan. great day, everybody. Thank you, Thank you Susan. Thanks, Janet. Thanks.